residents of Utah, Arizona and Nevada were all starting to experience in their communities high levels of people being diagnosed with leukemia and other cancers. When you are dead, your entire body, so that means limbs, organs, chemicals, the entire lot, can go for $550,000. An expert in his field, a Nobel Prize winner, an American citizen, said to this room full of government officials that if anybody had any bright ideas about stealing dead babies and children and lying to their families, that they would be serving their country. This is Humans, true stories about the most intriguing parts of human behavior, the good, the bad, and the downright horrific. I just wanna state before this video starts that I am not an expert in anything that I talk about today. I've just got information from books and journals and asked some friends who are a bit smarter than me. Um, I'll link everything that I've used in the description box down below if you wanna get a more detailed understanding. But I wanted to present it in a way that I would understand, so hopefully you will understand it too. In 1951, the United States government conducted a number of nuclear tests in the deserts of Nevada. For the next 40 years, the US conducted 1,054 nuclear tests and two nuclear attacks. The actual number of nuclear bombs and tests conducted in this period is likely much higher, but for a number of reasons, often these weren't documented, it might have been the fact that the bomb went off or the test went off in a non-noticeable way. So it wasn't documented, never mind the amount of destruction and devastation that was caused for the many years after that test was conducted. So in 1942, the US and the UK began a project to create the world's first nuclear weapons. They dropped two nuclear bombs on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of 1945. And although it's impossible to know the actual number of people that were killed during this attack, the number is likely well over 200,000. The devastating impact, of course, mainly killed citizens who were in those cities below. I actually can't get my head around how many people that is. And I looked it up and it's about two thirds of the population of Nottingham, which isn't gonna mean a lot to many people watching this video, but that is a huge amount. I encourage you to Google how many people are in your town and then picture 200,000 dying. That number is just out of this world. It's absolutely huge. It's horrible, but of course, it's an extremely effective way to show your power when fighting in a world war. And so it inspired the US to begin regular nuclear weapons testing. Ever since nuclear testing began, it's been a real challenge to understand exactly how that affects us as humans, as people. There's a couple of reasons for this. And one of those is military secrecy. Nuclear testing comes with a whole host of deadly side effects. So the people doing the testing, the military, the government, they wanted to keep it a secret. Also, historically, it's not well documented because documenting things means evidence and evidence means that loved ones of people affected by it can take legal action. We'll get to that. At the time that the testing first began, there was a little bit of an understanding over nuclear weapons. So I'll talk a little bit about that just to give you context of the time. There's this book called The Effects of Atomic Weapons, which was published in the 1950s. And that talks a bit about the understanding of atomic bombs at the time. It told us that an atomic bomb is a new, powerful kind of weapon. And it stated that it's different from what people then thought of as a normal bomb because of three reasons. Firstly, all uh, bombs release energy. That's what the actual explosion is. But nuclear bombs would release thousands times more energy than we were used to from regular TNT bombs at this time. Secondly, as well as the actual explosion of the bomb, there were also these sort of invisible penetrating rays that people weren't used to, they hadn't heard of anything like that before. And finally, what remains after the explosion are radioactive substances. We know now that those invisible rays I talked about are known as nuclear fallout, and that can travel for miles 
and miles. Um, fallout is the radioactive dust and ash that is created from the bomb. And in turn, that is then made into rain, which then can fall for hundreds, even thousands of miles around the test site. So it goes far and that can contaminate water supply. It can contaminate grass and in turn that affects obviously plant life and animals and us. So it's incredibly dangerous. And even though this wasn't widely known about in the 1950s, people did know about it. It wasn't unknown information. In fact, there was this um, event in the 1950s that was so obvious that it could not be ignored by the government. It had to be addressed and spoken about. Castle Bravo was a nuclear weapons test conducted by the United States. And that was conducted in a Bikini Atoll, which is in the Marshall Islands. It's hot and it's humid and the the weather year round is 27 to 29 degrees so that's about 80 to 85 fahrenheit so it is hot and it sits near the equator in the pacific ocean these 23 nuclear weapons tests took place between 1946 and 1958 and at the time the people who were living on the bikini atoll islands they were told that they would need to be evacuated just temporarily and they'd be able to return home really really soon the residents of Bikini Atoll were treated pretty horrendously. They were forced out of their homes and into another set of islands. And when they were there, it wasn't actually thought about how they might survive. So there wasn't enough food for all of these people. And many of those people starved to death. Meanwhile, back in Bikini Atoll, the United States were getting ready to test their most powerful nuclear weapon at that point. And it actually had a much higher destruction area than they had first thought. It was around two and a half times larger than they had expected. This meant that there was a lot of unexpected radiation contamination around the area of Bikini Atoll. The fallout of that atomic test conducted in Bikini Atoll fell on the residents of the nearby islands and the gaseous fallout spread for hundreds of miles around. On those nearby islands, where the radiation fallout had fallen on the residents nearby, they weren't actually evacuated from those areas until three days after that explosion. And obviously by this point, they'd already suffered irreversible radiation damage. The residents of Bikini Atoll were actually allowed to return home uh, in 1970. But then seven years later, experts were doing some regular radiation tests on a nearby water source and they realised that there were extremely high levels of strontium-90. The danger of this is potential cell damage and cancer, so it's incredibly dangerous. So all of the residents, again, were evacuated three years later, and they've never returned. Right now, Bikini Atoll is mainly home to visitors like experts measuring radiation and tourists. In light of this, the US did establish a sort of trust fund for the people affected, and that was around $5 million. No, of course it wasn't. It was around $550 each. Completely relocate your life. We're gonna destroy your home and you might die of cancer, but here's $550. The US decided that in order to keep their nuclear weapons the best, they would have to bring testing a little closer to home. Clever. So by the early 1950s, they'd chosen their test site and it was going to be a little north of Las Vegas in Nevada. And they said that they chose this place because of its flat earth and its low population and its easterly winds. So they would be blowing towards other parts of Nevada and Utah and Arizona rather than the densely populated West Coast. Tests were usually conducted when they knew that the winds would be blowing away from Las Vegas and California. Never mind that it would, of course, blow those winds towards east or the northeast. In 1951, a one kiloton bomb was detonated as a test in the Nevada test site. And at the time, the general public were aware of nuclear bombs and the sort of destruction they could cause because of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, but they weren't aware to the extent that we are now. And to be honest, at the time, people were more worried about a potential nuclear threat from somewhere like, say, Russia, 
than their own government performing tests and the potential fallout of that and what that could cause. We now know that they should have been worried. And we only know that now because of declassified documents that have become available over the last few years that show that back in 1947, so way before this testing was at its peak, experts did know of the potential damage to human life. They knew that atomic bombs could release these toxins that then could be fatal to anyone who was exposed after the explosion itself. So the experts knew, but they chose not to stop. In fact, they promised the residents that lived downwind of the test site that the tests would be conducted safely and they would be fine. And of course they believed them, they trusted the government. And to be honest, even if they didn't, they couldn't just get up and move. Most people didn't have the means to do that. So they just sat and waited and believed that they would be okay, or at least hoped they would. Unfortunately, those people would pay the price for the government's decisions for years and years to come. So when the test started in Nevada, the government had to try and get people on board. They couldn't ignore the fact that these massive tests, these massive explosions were happening just down the road from them. And in an effort to improve public relations, in 1953, they actually invited 600 local residents to come down and take a look at a test shop viewers would get to watch these massive explosions from about seven miles out. And they would then be taken to the actual test site and they'd get to look around and see what destruction had happened to these houses and mannequins that had been set up beforehand. A test carried out in 1953, which was codenamed Hamlet, carried a huge amount of debris over southern Utah. Ranchers began to notice that their sheep were suffering from lesions and scabs on their mouths and they'd have huge clumps of wool just fall out for no reason or no known reason at that time. And very quickly, their sheep would start to die. They also began miscarrying and delivering stillborn lambs. And this would be in incredibly high numbers, like nothing they'd been used to before. It turned out that after that test in 1953, Hamlet, the sheep had then been eating radioactive grass around 20,000 sheep died. And this was really noticeable, obviously. And so people started talking out about their concerns and asking what was going on. And because these ranches lived downwind of the test site, they had previously been given these little radiation meters where they could actually measure the amount of radiation. And they did this over the coming few years after that 1953 test. And the radiation meters reported off the scale readings. The AEC, which is the Atomic Energy Commission, then sent out experts to go and see if radiation was actually the issue and was what was going on here. Unfortunately, it had been a little while since these sheep had died, and so many of the carcasses had been destroyed and they weren't there to test. The AEC allegedly then made the experts rewrite their reports to eliminate any mentioning of radiation or its effects. They responded to people's concerns by saying that radiation had nothing to do with why their sheep were dying and it was probably just malnutrition. Even with this kind of shady behaviour and the reassurance from the people in charge that things were okay, obviously the general population were becoming more and more worried. They did not trust what was happening. In the mid-1950s, a group of people brought lawsuits against the government saying that the nuclear testing had caused their animals to die. At the trial, government-appointed experts testified that there was no way that radiation could have caused these animals to die, which was absolutely untrue. But this, unfortunately, was nowhere near the worst of it. In the late 1950s, residents of Utah, Arizona and Nevada were all starting to experience in their communities high levels of people being diagnosed with leukemia and other cancers. Places where childhood leukemia had never been a thing before or had been extremely low were starting to see a real rise in the cases that were being diagnosed. And residents also reported an increase in miscarriages and birth defects. People who had lost animals and friends and children 
did file lawsuits at the time, but the government completely denied any responsibility. And unfortunately, that meant that the victims didn't get any sort of compensation or even any recognition at the time. Meanwhile, the United States, the United Kingdom and Australia were all beginning to realise and understand that radiation could affect people in really, really harmful ways. That's when they decided they needed to figure out exactly how much radiation would make Earth completely uninhabitable. They needed to understand how to deal with emergencies that might arise as part of an atomic explosion and to help with treatment of the injured people. The reason they felt it so urgent, in their opinion, was because atomic and nuclear weapons were becoming used more and more. So they claimed that there were two main reasons for doing this. The first was that they wanted to determine if radioactive fallout was harmful for humans. And if no hazard had occurred yet, they wanted to know how many bombs could be handled or tolerated to keep the fallout at a safe amount. They needed these samples to be taken from nearby to detonation sites, so areas with high fallout. Six areas were then suggested, which were northern Utah or southwestern Idaho, Kansas or Iowa, Boston, Massachusetts, South America, England, and Japan. They would collect and study three age groups, 0 to 10, 10 to 20, and 20 plus. And they'd be studying the ends of ribs and teeth. But how would they do those studies? They couldn't just set off a load of nuclear bombs in the US and then use all the people that had died from cancer and other fallout related matters and study them. Except, of course, they'd already set off a load of explosions in Nevada and a lot of people who lived downwind of Nevada at that time had died, so they could. The problem was, imagine setting up these big ass nuclear test sites and at first making a big spectacle out of it and even inviting people down to come and watch the explosion and possibly get a little bit of radioactive fallout on them and then realised that it was killing people, so probably stop doing that. But oh, by the way, we need the bodies of your dead loved ones so that we can study them. Families lost to the incompetencies of the government and their need for power. People would never agree to it. And the government knew that, and the AEC knew that. So they decided to carry on with this study. They would just keep it a secret. And it was beautifully named Project Sunshine. Side note, they started Project Sunshine in 1953, which is a full 39 years before the last bomb at the Nevada test site. So they knew that there were deathly health effects being caused by these bombs, but they didn't stop. They just carried on and used those who died to further their understanding. The nuclear testing agency tracked the fallout clouds and they found that although these clouds could drift hundreds, even thousands of miles away, it's where it rains out that the effects are experienced. They needed more information so they continued testing and they even added more hazardous materials to the bombs like coal and other debris. Many of the 160 fallout clouds drifted across the American west and eastward with radiation levels comparable to those released at Chernobyl. But residents of the downwind areas were constantly told that there was no danger. So anyway, the um, thing that the scientists and experts really wanted to measure was strontium-90. Strontium-90 is the most hazardous component of radioactive fallout. It's thought that it can damage the DNA in cells and can cause cancer. Strontium behaves similarly to calcium and so scientists were concerned about people actually absorbing it into their bones. They were particularly keen to examine the bones of children and babies. This is from what I understand because children and babies are still growing and so they absorb much more strontium-90 than an adult for example. But the problem was that it's difficult to measure levels of strontium in living people. The best way to analyse it is to cremate the bones of the dead and then 
test their ashes. So researchers, the AEC, the government all decided that they needed to get bodies of babies and children from all over the world and begin testing them. AEC Commissioner Dr Willard Libby was an American physical chemist and he also won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry and he was also a primary advocate, a proper keen bean for Project Sunshine. In some documents that were declassified many years after Dr Libby's death, he said that there were gaps in data and they needed human remains. He then told a room full of people, some of these are government officials, that they need to do some body snatching. He said, and these are his words, quote, I don't know how to snatch bodies. In the original study, we hired an expensive law firm to look up the law of body snatching. It is not very encouraging. It shows you how very difficult it is going to be to do legally, end quote. So he knows it's wrong. He's not unaware of the ethical dilemma in accidentally poisoning a load of residents in your own country and then using the bodies of the ones that died off to aid their research of nuclear testing and its effects. But Dr Libby was looked up to as some kind of hero. AEC, the company that Dr Libby worked for, was able to get hold of a load of stillborn children and run tests on them. I couldn't find a whole load of information about how or why this was able to happen. But again, Dr Libby says, quote, We were fortunate, as you know, to obtain a large number of stillborns as material. This supply, however, has now been cut off also and shows no signs, I think, of being rejuvenated, end quote. He also went on to say, quote, If anybody knows how to do a good job of body snatching, they will really be serving their country. An expert in his field, a Nobel Prize winner, an American citizen, said to this room full of government officials that if anybody had any bright ideas about stealing dead babies and children and lying to their families, that they would be serving their country. In this room, many horrible things were discussed including other leads where they could gain access to cadavers from all ages. And it was suggested that the military could help bring in cadavers from a native hospital too. High up officials asked researchers to use their personal contacts to recruit others to gather cadavers for them. But of course they weren't going to be honest about it at all. They would say things like, oh, these cadavers are just needed to measure normal levels of radium that are found in the general population. And look, using dead bodies for medical research is pretty standard. It's been done for years and years, a really long time. Back in the day when surgeries were performed, the most common being amputations, for example, it wasn't long before surgeons began practicing their techniques and they were actually able to figure out ways of reducing bleeding or lessen the chance of infection, things like that. And even now, human cadavers are used as a foundation for surgical training. The issue here, in this case, is consent. And I do think it's important to say that there's an argument here for context. This is the 1950s and things were very different back then. But when was stealing dead babies ever okay? When was lying to the families ever okay? Unfortunately, we do see this kind of thing happen today. Maybe not by the government that we're aware of, but in other situations, we do see it happen in 2022. Bodies are expensive. When you are dead, your entire body, so that means limbs, organs, chemicals, the entire lot, can go for $550,000. It is no wonder that people get the idea of selling their bits on the black market. On the black market, for example, someone selling a kidney might get around $5,000, but then that can be sold on for up to $150,000. So it's an extremely profitable market. In 2015, the FBI raided a crematorium in Chicago where they found hundreds of body parts being resold to medical organisations for hundreds of thousand pounds worth of profit. 
this was being done for scientific research. The problem is that no one told the families what was happening. The victims' families were being told specifically that the organs were being donated. They were not being sold on. And it was discovered that various parts of their bodies were being sold, including kidneys, which you might expect, and elbows. And we know that this is obviously unacceptable and is widely looked on as a pretty inhumane thing to do. But back in 1955, the US, the UK and Australian governments decided that this was an okay thing to do. This happened to a huge number of people as part of Project Sunshine, but we don't have access to the exact information because obviously the government don't want to talk about it. They don't want to put it in the media for everyone to be able to have access to. The people who had lost loved ones to AEC's actions and their greed did speak out, but for many, many years, they weren't listened to. That was until 1990, the people's voices did matter. The then president, George Bush, signed into law the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. It created a $100 million trust fund to compensate people who had lived downwind of the Nevada test site when those tests were being conducted. And it was specifically for people who had suffered from radiation sickness or some illness related to that. That $100 million cap wasn't very much though, and so later on it was increased. They were finally taking some responsibility for what they'd done, but those funds weren't actually made available to everyone who needed them. There are hundreds of people who have submitted claims stating that their cancer is likely a result of that nuclear fallout, but they weren't actually able to get any compensation because of some restrictions that were written into that legislation at the time. Restrictions that aren't necessarily valid. George Bush said, quote, the United States should recognise and assume responsibility for harm done to these individuals. And Congress recognises that the lives and health of uranium miners and of innocent individuals who lived downwind from the Nevada test sites were involuntarily subjected to increased risk of injury and disease to serve the national security interests of the United States. The Congress apologises on behalf of the nation to the individuals and their families for the hardship they have endured. End quote. In 1994, the then president, Bill Clinton, ordered an investigation into the body snatching program, along with a number of other questionable government experiments and tests. We do know now that a man who died at the age of 34 in April of 1955, he had died of encephalitis, which is an inflammation of the brain, usually caused by infection. He is known in this context only as B199, a doctor who was working at Vancouver General Hospital, answered this call from Project Sunshine and shipped him over without consent from Vancouver to the United States. He was cremated and then his ashes were analysed in an effort to find out whether the nuclear weapons testing had in fact poisoned him. B199 was one of at least 127 people who were shipped over from Vancouver without consent and used for testing. Altogether, around 6,000 corpses, most of them unidentified, were transported from all over the world to the US for help with Project Sunshine. And this was all done in secret. Bodies of stillborn babies were taken from Australia for use in the project and none of this was known publicly until recently. There are a huge number of transcripts and documents from Project Sunshine that over the years have mysteriously disappeared or gone missing. So the true extent of what was discussed and what was carried out as part of Project Sunshine will likely never be known. This is Humans, true stories about the most intriguing parts of human behaviour, the good, the bad and the downright horrific. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Humans. Come back next week for another episode. If you've got a case suggestion, let me know down below. If you haven't thumbs up, please thumbs up it. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. 
and I'll see you next week for another episode. Goodbye.